Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like uh, to thank the organizers uh, um, for, for the opportunity, truly, for, to, to present this, this work here. It's, um, it, it's really, um, uh, truly, I mean, for me, it's quite uh, remarkable. So uh, I'd like to talk about some work that we, we developed uh, in the group of, of Professor Ernst Mayer. Uh, during the past years, and uh, this work is uh, actually a collaboration between uh, many different research groups, and lots of people contributed very substantially. But uh, these three stand out. I mean, Chemi uh, for well, not only the experiments, but also for for the numerous discussions that we had together, Alexis and Ernst for a lot for. I mean, teaching me how to bridge the simulations with this quite complex experiments that were, uh, they're performing there. And uh, yeah, so just, uh, so I have recently moved to the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, uh, where I, I have started, say, a junior uh, uh, gr group a leader, a five-year tenure. And uh, so, uh, so, uh, my talk will concern about uh, the role of flexibility in different trilogical aspects, particularly friction and adhesion. And uh, I, I'm not so much worried in upscaling this. Instead, uh, uh, the interest here is focused in understanding how flexibility at single molecule level um, plays out in different dissipation processes. And, uh, well, this, this taps into fundamental questions, as, as we have heard from this beautiful talk this morning of Urwak on how rigid sliders now allow us realizing a wide range of superconducting, inter uh, sorry, super lubric interfaces, uh, as the rigidity of the sliders prevents interlocking. And uh, so one question that stands is if superlubricity and flexibility are compatible. And uh, the other thing that uh, it's perhaps more in the long run is uh, as a, as a, from the tribology community to try to tackle some issues emerging in other fields, such as the burgeoning fields of molecular machines, where this uh, single flexible molecules, where you have uh, bonds rotating around a single CC bond, uh, allowed to produce work and transmit it into the media, and also to understand how molecules move over surfaces, which is super important for supramolecular devices, for example. And I realized how difficult it is when talking with Hemi, and um, you might have heard about this first nanocar race, uh, where five world-leading groups had to propel their molecules over a surface for a finite amount of time, and only two out of these five groups were able to do it. And, um, well, actually, uh, they got the first prize for this. And, um, well, so I'd like to discuss then the role of flexibility in different processes, in the adsorption, uh, the friction, and then, say, in a more collective effect, so the motion of an, an ensemble of molecules. So these works have been published uh, in, in various uh, publications. You can find the references here. And uh, I will uh, leave uh, at the end of the line the references. So the methods that we used were very closely interconnected experiments and simulations. I was responsible for the simulations part. And uh, so the main workhorse is molecular dynamics simulations. The thing was that we're interested in this very delicate, say, a bending, a specific bending or a torsion. And whereas general force fields allow us to describe, say, even the dynamics of DNA or proteins or many other complex systems, here, we really needed something with a bit more precision. So we, what we did is we compute 
the, the infrared spectra, so the vibration or the dynamic matrix of our molecule at the QM level. And then we fit it to a common uh, form for, uh, which this is called the force field or common force field where you have, say, a stretching term, uh, stretchings, bendings, torsions, and so forth. And then when you compare in red the quantum mechanical data of the different vibration frequencies of the different normal no, no, modes with the classical data, you see that we have really good overlap. So this allows us to describe with the spectroscopic accuracy vibrations of molecules. But not only that, it also opens the possibility to tackle any other molecule we wish. So we're not bound by the available force field. And then these are going together with cryoforce spectroscopy experiments to manipulate the molecules as already described by Remy. This was experiments were performed by Remy and also Philip Dostolfo, a PhD student that has just finished his thesis. So the, the systems that I'm going to consider, the first bulk of the talk, will deal with absorption and friction, and they, in both cases, will use the same molecule. And this is the one that Remy already mentioned yesterday, and we could call it as a flexible graphene nanoribbon. As we have, say, this polyaromatic structure that is interlinked by a single carbon bond where you have this bending and distortion. This, in the distortion alone, already has some effects. So, for example, we see that the molecules, they absorb along bent conformations. And then another thing is that contrary to graphene and ribbons that align along compact directions, um, we observed that um, these molecules are oriented along non-compact directions. Um, so first, the absorption, this I'll be very brief, as Remy already uh, mentioned uh, uh, a, a substantial part. So we, we have the molecule that is deposited over the surface, as you can see here, and then we started lifting it up. Uh, you can measure the gradient of the normal force while you do so, and then when you look to, which is, we call contact stiffness, and then when you look to the contact stiffness, you observe short and long detachment units. This is quite surprising considering that it's a chain of, uh, composed of uh, identical units. And uh, this repeats throughout the whole lifting process, in the simulations, in the experiments, and uh, to understand this, uh, there are two basic ingredients. The first is symmetry breaking of the chain as you lift it. So you might remember the talk uh, from Andrea Silva the, the, this, this Monday, where he lifted this graphene and the ribbons, and you saw how they, they, they followed along, say, the, the line that they were origin, originally oriented. Here it's not the case because the molecule is absorbed along a non-compact direction. And uh, so in order to go forward, this was already discussed by uh, Roberto Guerra and also Nicola Manini, that there is this uh, uh, compact directions along which this graphitic structure, nano ribbons, uh, have much lower friction. So, and this also happens here for this flexible chain. So since it doesn't want a long to go along this uh, high friction uh, direction, it rotates, and this leads to spontaneous, to, to symmetry breaking. The other ingredient is the torsion between consecutive units. And uh, this torsion, ultimately uh, combined with this rotation, is what explains the two detachment lengths. So if uh, one unit, when, once detaches, it rotates anti-clockwise as this screen, it moves away from the sliding axis, whereas if it rotates clockwise, it moves towards the sliding axis. As you can see this quite nicely. The green units uh, are, are moving away. The purple ones are moving towards the sliding axis. And uh, in this the motion led by distortion of these units, you have different forces to detach each unit. So, this internal degree of freedom, this 
additional flexibility allow it to basically differentiate these two kinds of detachments. So the, 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 the second part is friction. Um, the same molecule absorbed over cold surface along these non-compact directions, we lift it up and then uh, we manipulate it. As we manipulate the molecule, we can measure the contact stiffness, which is again, the gradient of the normal force. And the, this contact stiffness, you can see that it has some modulation. And this has been shown before that when it increases, it relates to a stick event. And when it decreases, it's related to a slip event. So the same uh, stick slip uh, behavior is seen also in our simulations. But what's puzzling is uh, the distances. So the distance between the stick slip events is not the lattice distance along this non-compact direction. So in experiments and simulations, we get something around 0 0.25 nanometers. As compared to 0 0.5 nanometers, which is the periodicity along the sliding direction, or uh, 0 0.29, which is the distance between the gold atoms. And uh, the the, the, the reason or what's happening here, this behind this kind of sublattice stick slip motion, is because as we manipulate the molecule, uh, we have this non trivial sidewinding zigzag motion of the molecule, which is essentially composed by three elements. And here it's quite important to note that this is observed for regardless of the chain length. For example, the uh, we, uh, that you can get it for chains as small as three uh, units. So the first thing that happens is there is the tail rotation. The second is at it, each individual unit, uh, instead of going from one lattice position to the next, it jumps into a intermediate position. So this allows it, the unit to always go along compact directions. You can see it goes from here to here. And therefore, you break a motion of 0 0.5 nanometers into 2 of 0 0.25. And uh, another interesting thing is when you look at the trajectory of these units, for example, this unit 2, the first that is in contact, and in gray, we represent the, the gold atoms. And you can see how it zigzags. Uh, the center of mass uh, goes from one gold atom to the other. But as you go along the chain, you see that not all motion is coordinated. You see, for example, this unit U5 is moving in antiphase with respect to this U2. So as this one goes away from the sliding axis and then approaches, the other does exactly the opposite. And uh, this gives rise to this undulation that we see on the chain. So the other thing is what happens to this dynamics as we lift slightly more the molecule. And uh, so to make it short, it changes. So we go from a regular uh, 0 0.25 nanometer stick slip behavior to longer jumps. And when you look at the traces, you see that these jumps are almost one nanometer long. And this is also reproduced in, in our simulations. And actually, you can have, a, a say, a more better understand if you look to the how this contact stiffness changes with the height. So here we have the displacement, and then in the y-axis we have the height of the molecule, and in colored we put the contact stiffness. Say black is the peak, so a stick event, white would be a, a slip event. And you can see that at low heights we have this high periodicity of stick events, and as soon as we start lifting the molecule, they start to fade away and give rise to these longer uh, uh, slip events. So it's quite, uh, and actually when you look at the trajectory, you also see that it changes very dramatically. Not only the contact stiffness, this only uh, reflects that there's a different dynamics of the chain. And um, so it's quite uh, uh, remarkable that by changing, say, 0, 1, nanometer in the chain height, you can change the dynamics of a nine nanometer long chain. And uh, the reason for this is once again the torsion between the units. 
uh, as the chain is absorbed, it, is, it remains flat, so the angle between consecutive units is, is zero. When you have this strong contact regime where the molecule is, this, the one that is in contact is essentially flat, you will see that distortion visits values around plus minus one degrees. So you essentially here at the maximum. However, as soon as you lift, start lifting the molecule, even by a small amount, you enter into this purple region where the angle between consecutive units changes from four to 12 or 10 degrees. And most importantly, you have a substantial energy change in this case, which gives rise to a net torque to this front unit and then changes very much the dynamics of this, of this molecule. So by lifting a little bit more the molecule, what you're doing is switching on or off the relevance of this degree of freedom. The other thing was how this uh, zigzag motion endures a backward scan. And uh, you know that uh, uh, Shigeki Kawai and Andrea Benassi uh, showed that this was possible to realize in graphene and ribbons, and this was associated with its superlubricity effect. And um, so we, we got curious if a flexible chain like this one could also sustain this. And uh, the answer is yes, you can drag the molecule backwards and uh, it still continues to do in this zigzag motion, but now we, not at an angle, but essentially uh, straight with respect to the, to the sliding axis. But when you look at the trajectories of the individual units, so in black is the trajectory of this first unit in the forward manipulation, and in blue in the backward. And you can see they are essentially overlapping. And moreover, it's kind of, you see, it's very smooth transition from here to here. There's no stick and slip. It's, everything happens smoothly. And this actually relates to, to the fact that the forward and backward trace is also seen experimentally. Uh, have essentially you no know, hysteresis, which we also saw in our simulations. And what's, what's funny is when you contrast it with this uh, results for the graphene nanoribbons, where you saw much bigger hysteresis. And this kind of uh, indicated that, well, these chains, they have really low friction so that you can actually manipulate them uh, quite easily. And here we showed the, the lateral sliding forces obtained from our simulations. And you can see that the static force is about 40 piconewtons for a ribbon of about 10 nanometers long, which is about the same value that uh, Shigeki and Andrea saw for this graphene nanoribbons. And uh, moreover, here we're sliding in a non-compact direction, in a higher friction direction. So uh, this flexible design it's possible to achieve this ultra low superlubricity. And then this was actually prompted by Alexis. Uh, we look at how this uh, friction changed as we increase the, the, the chain length. And you can see here on the right hand side, the lateral force for two different chains. One is about 13 nanometers and the other is 21. So you can see it's almost double the size, however, the, the force is essentially the same. And this leads to this vanishing uh, friction for contact area. When you plot the static force or the average force, whatever component you wish to pick, you will see that as you increase the chain length, this decreases. And this is quite surprising because um, the, the molecule, as you can see here, it's improving its registry in every slip event. So it's not uh, structural superlubricity because uh, you're improving your registry as you go along. So we call it this flexible superlubricity. However, uh, they emanate from the very same source, and that is the incommensurability between the chain and the gold. So that the, you know that distance between this, uh, say, hollow sites of graphene uh, are 0.24 nanometers, and compared to 0.29 in gold. 
And uh, what this makes is this induces a bending in the chain. And you can see here this bending angle between consecutive units in black as we slide the molecule. You can see how it oscillates. And uh, in, in gray, we show this bending angle for another unit further down the chain. And you can see that as you enter the, into this, when you begin the onset of the slip event here, indicated by this dashed line, you see how this angle drops to zero in both cases. So the chain is, is bent, and then when it begins to slip, it straightens, and, uh, and then it recovers a new bent configuration. And uh, so in this way, this uh, mechanical energy is being transferred and released from the chain into the slip and vice versa. And uh, you could think that, well, if you, this doesn't scale because if you have a sufficiently long chain, then you, you need to synchronize this bending event and this will cost more and more, um, more and more energy. The, the funny thing is that they are never synchronized. Here you show the, the, this angle for the different units, uh, for we take, I think, 10, and you, you can see that they are never perfectly synchronized because this incommensurability between the graphene, this polyaromatic uh, carbons and the gold leads to this, say, a synchronous excitation of this internal degree of freedom. So, in a way, uh, you have this incommensurability between these two systems that permeates into spatial incoherent bending, uh, kind of similar to this uh, structural superlubricity, but in a more dynamic fashion. Uh, here uh, I was comparing, uh, I compared some results for a rigid and flexible chain, and the, the results are quite obvious. The first thing in blue is the rigid, and in black is the flexible, is that you can see that the flexible can obviously split uh, an event, a slip event of 0 0.5 nanometers in two, and uh, that the energy barrier, the static friction force is lower for, for, this, uh, for this behavior for the reasons already mentioned and also because you need to unpin a smaller amount of atoms. So now I will very briefly mention uh, on this assembly, mostly because it's, it's, quite, uh, uh, it's quite entertaining, I think. So um, you have this um, hard uh, aromatic core uh, this was work done by Sebastian Scherb, Antoine Ino, and also Rémi Pavlak. And uh, they had this aromatic core, and it was, they were wondering what was the role of these flexible chains. If you add these flexible chains to this rigid core, what would happen? Uh, and in particular, they were interested in molecular assemblies. Here you can see the molecular assembly at 5K. These bright dots correspond to the center of each molecule. So you can measure the distance between the bright dots and you get the distance between the molecules. You do it at 5 Kelvin and at 300 Kelvin and you can get a thermal expansion coefficient, which is 1,000 larger than uh, conventional materials and 10,000 larger than any other material. So this already tells us there is a major anharmonic effect playing a role here. And uh, well, Th th that is actually the flexibility of the chain. When you're at low temperature, the system compacts to increase the interaction between the molecules. Uh, however, when you increase the temperature, this changes. So this is the molecule at 300 Kelvin, and you can see that although you have energy to, to move the, the change, you still cannot diffuse the molecule. However, the assembly, when you're together, this fluctuations, they lead to this uh, uh, thermal expansion of, of the chain, this anharmonic fluctuations of the side, this flexible side chains allow us to reach this giant thermal expansion. So to come at an end, so we've, we've shown how this flexibility allows us to tune the torsion, uh, how it gives rise to this flexible superlubricity and how we can use it to, 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 to create materials with giant thermal expansion. I'd like to thank all the people involved in, the, in this work, the, the group uh, of Ernst, which um, 
and, uh, and thank you for all the funding agencies and thank you all for your attention. Other questions? I have a hope to. Yeah, thank you, Guilherme. Very interesting results. Um, I was wondering whether you have some benchmark about the, uh, the role of the interaction potential that you use between the, the molecule and the substrate, because I, I expect that so that the subtle detail that you find might be influenced by, in particular, by this potential. So have you tried the robustness of these results against this? Thank you. So, um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very good point. Um, I, I, I did tr try this. Um, um, I, I, in particular, the, the one that I'm using for these simulations is uh, the, the potential from Stefano Corny, the scope force field. Um, and the, the, I tried with others like this interface and, and other Lenardrons parameterization. I just saw your recent publication on a new gold force field. Um, and uh, this one, the, the scope force field, was the one that was able to reproduce better the absorption energies of these, these, these individual units. And uh, well, as, as you can see, it captures very nicely the, the dynamics also of the chain. The, and um, so, yeah, so I, I did test it and, and I found out that the scope, it's quite, uh, uh, or it served quite well this purpose, especially for aromatic compounds. Uh, thanks, uh, very intriguing phenomena uh, you show. I was wondering, uh, uh, these chains are uh, oriented along, I guess, a specific direction of the gold substrate uh, uh, along the, the reconstruction of the, of the ribbon. Uh, do you know what, what is the, the relative size of the moiré pattern uh, in this direction and the unit cell of your uh, chain? Like are these uh, the unit of the, your uh, chain like sub moiré space, sub moiré tile? That's a good question. So I did look at this because this is one analysis that uh, Roberto and Nicola and, and Andrea, I think they, they also did for the ribbons. But in this case, the, the molecule is, is really so thin that, uh, I mean, and then it bends to commensurate. And so uh, I, don't, I, I don't know by hand the, what would be the size of the moiré. It's along the non-compact direction. Um, I, so I, I, I cannot recall, but. But like, it would be interesting to see how it scales with the area of this, if you can link like a unit uh, size, of, a unit of different area and connect them with these uh, bridges, how it will scale with the area of those. Okay. But yeah, like. And we can discuss later. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I think we should move on to the next talk, uh, which <laughs> will be given by uh, Olivier Nouveau.